Why is Bill Gates suddenly the go-to guy on vaccines, population control, farming, et cetera? I mean, the, guy, the guy's a computer programmer. That's what he is. Well, there's no reason for him to be deemed an expert on any of these things beyond the fact that he is rich and he has used his wealth to buy himself a seat at the policymaking table and to elevate himself to the status of a cultural sage and a public intellectual. He's literally bought this place in society. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Okay, on today's podcast, I wanna start out by talking about, we're gonna talk about Bill Gates. But I want to start by talking about conspiracy theories. I have appreciated the, gosh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 comments that we've had on YouTube alone. And I've tried to keep up with them, and I apologize that I maybe haven't done that uh, particularly well. But I've noticed that several of you, very well-intentioned, are saying, wow, you know, maybe he doesn't get it about conspiracy theories, you know, because you've heard me really kind of trash conspiracy theories. Theories. Let me explain to you a little more clearly what I mean by that. And rather than trying to respond to 100 comments about conspiracy theories, I just thought I would do it right here on the podcast itself. I had said to you that conspiracy theories are, by definition, secret. And several of you have responded to that by saying, no, 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 That's, they're not secret. According to Merriam-Webster, conspiracy is, and I quote, a plan secretly devised to accomplish an evil or treacherous end. They are, by definition, literal definition, secret. But my point there in, in speaking to conspiracy theories wasn't to say that there aren't any secret agendas in the things that we're talking about on this show, particularly when you get to individuals like, say, Klaus Schwab or the World Economic Forum or today, Bill Gates. There are. Rather, my point is simply one of research methodology. Don't be distracted from the real agenda by false ones or those that are unprovable. Historian James Spedding said this. He said that, when a historian is confronted with a statement of fact, he must ask himself two questions. Who first said it and what opportunity had he of knowing it? If you apply that simple methodology to your research, many, many false trails you know, fall away. And that's, that's the methodology that I follow in a program like this. So, and think about it like this as well. If, if I want to hide something that's true and I have the resources to hire an army of people to flood chat rooms, the YouTube comments uh, beneath a popular podcast like this one, uh, and fact check headlines, 
I can hide the truth in plain sight. Do you remember the film, The Hunt for Red October? You know, Tom Clancy's novel made into a blockbuster movie. A torpedo is zeroing in on the submarine and then they deploy what they call countermeasures. You remember that? They shoot them out and they look like Alka-Seltzer, you know, spinning in the, uh, in the water. And those things impersonate the submarine and they lead the torpedo on the wrong path. Um, that's what conspiracy theories and fact checks are meant to do. They lead you away from the obvious. And somewhere right now, a, a couple of zit-faced punks are sniggering like Beavis and Butthead and saying to themselves, look what we did. We've got half the internet debating whether or not Klaus Schwab is really a Rothschild and the other half debating whether or not Jeffrey Epstein is still alive. My point isn't to, be, to debunk either of those. My point is to stay on task and to keep following the obvious that's right in front of you. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seen to be too toxic. At Tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at Tomap.com. And they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. Uh, I was watching recently. Do you remember the old Western uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with, um, who is it, Paul Newman and uh, who's the other guy? Robert Redford. Robert Redford. And there's a, a, a hilarious sequence in that film where they're trying to, they've robbed a bank and they're trying to escape a posse. And they ride on and then they, you know, they're, they're in the cliffs or something and they look back and they see a dust cloud, you know, that's following them. So they decide to lay down a false trail and to see whether or not they can you know, lose these guys. And then they ride on and again, they're looking back and they see the dust cloud start to follow the false trail and then they see it move right back over <laughs> to the real one. And they keep saying, who are these guys? Who are these guys <laughs> that they can't do? That's the way I think of research on topics like this. I'm that guy, I'm, I'm that dust cloud that is coming in the distance, that is pursuing the truth as it relates to these things. Again, not saying that there aren't any genuine secret agendas that are going on here, but I would prefer to point out to you the obvious because the obvious is upsetting and dangerous enough. And what I'm gonna tell you about Bill Gates today, I hope, um, you know, helps to, helps to cut through the clutter. Uh, not just about his parentage or, you know, whether or not he's a lizard people, you know, alien you know, or something like that. Let's look at who the guy is. Don't ignore the obvious. Now, I want to begin today with a video. It is, it is a video from, um, it's Bill Gates Foundation. They, they put out this video and that uh, in and of itself is actually interesting. It is a little video of him talking about population, overpopulation. Now let's, let's listen to this. In this year's annual letter, Melinda and I take the toughest questions we get asked and give our answers. One that's come up for a long time is, 
As we make the world healthier, is the population going to get so big that feeding everybody and maintaining the environment is going to be impossible? Here we can see a chart that looks at the total world population over the last several hundred years. And at first glance, this is a bit scary. We go from less than a billion in 1800, and then three, four, five, six, and 7.4 billion where we are today is happening even faster. So Melinda and I wondered whether providing new medicines and keeping children alive, would that create more of a population problem? What we found out is that as health improves, families choose to have less children. And this effect is very, very dramatic. We find that in every country of the world, this is repeated. The population growth goes down as we improve health. So we've taken that chart that shows the global population growth, and we've actually extended it out all the way to 2100. And we can see that instead of continuing, it actually flattens out. Another way to see that is through this rate of population growth. And you can see that in the 60s, that reached a pretty high number, over 2% per year. And it's now come way, way down. Now, 11 billion people is still a lot, but the good news is that the faster we improve health, the faster family size goes down. And so we can feel great about saving those lives We can feel great about saving those lives, he says. The implication being, if it led to what we consider to be overpopulation, we couldn't feel great about saving those lives. Something we do on this podcast, I state as my own personal mission, is uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5, where the Apostle Paul says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that sets itself up against the knowledge of of God. And uh, I want to demolish Bill Gates on, on this podcast today. And it is because what Bill Gates is pushing is evil. I mean, it's fundamentally evil. And uh, hopefully you'll see that as we, as we go along. He says this, so Melinda and I wondered whether providing new medicines and keeping children alive, would that create more of a population problem? Now, now think about this for just for just a second. Yeah, and by the way, you can see her saying exactly the same thing in an interview she did in Africa with 60 Minutes, where they're, you, you find this on YouTube, where they are discussing this woman who has two children, but she's had a total of eight, and six of them are, have died. And the host, the interviewer, says to her, um, wow, you know, I mean, she had eight children, but... Um, it's kind of a good thing, you know, that maybe six of them died. I mean, the last thing Africa needs is another six people. And she kind of agrees with this. And she says, oh, yes, but um, what we're, we're trying to get to is a place where, where medicines lead to families having fewer children. That's our goal. So the goal isn't to save lives. The goal is depopulation. And by the way, in case you wonder about this, she gave, I think last year, a whopping, I don't know, somewhere between 200 and 250 million to Planned Parenthood. And together, she and Bill Gates, they're divorced now, but the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation still exists, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on that. Together, they've given hundreds of millions of dollars to population control programs globally. So that this, this is a major driver from them. Now, the thing that strikes me as interesting about this video, in addition to his own verbiage, is the fact that Bill Gates produced it. This isn't, this isn't an interview. This is a, if you watch it, it's a, it's a, a set that's carefully uh, arranged and has nice graphics and all this kind of stuff. In other words, Bill Gates produced it, meaning it's carefully scripted and edited. It also means that he signed off on the video in its final form. This is a guy who said, yeah, that's good. Post it. I'm awesome. <laughs> he, he liked what it said. And yet, 
I think normal people would watch this and say his godless, elitist, sociopathic worldview sneaks in like the proverbial camel's nose under the tent. He just can't, he just can't help it. it. It comes out. And such thinking is apparently so prevalent in the circles in which he moves. I mean, the guy gives TED Talks. He's a member of the WEFT, a central member of the WEFT, that is to say the World Economic Forum that he really thinks this sounds like solid moral reasoning to him. It tells you how out of touch these people are with normal, decent people. They're, they're moving in a set of other people who are like-minded, and they don't really, really hear you know, the thoughts of people at a lower socioeconomic level. A normal, decent person would see a starving man and try to feed him. That's not the way Bill Gates and his ilk think. There's not enough moral imperative in that alone for them. Their first thoughts are utilitarian. But will it harm the planet? Should I, should I give that man a meal or will it harm the planet? That's not the way normal people think. That isn't the way normal people think. It's utilitarianism. It's this idea of you know, what, is, what they deem to be best for the common good. Uh, for the planet, as they will say. And probably the, the, the most well-known utilitarian of modern times is Peter Singer. And I've referenced him on this podcast before. I know Peter. I've dined with Peter. We've done a couple of debates with Peter Singer, one at Princeton, one at Melbourne, Australia, my colleague, friend, uh, Professor John Lennox of Oxford University, taking him on, as did Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh took him on as well. And Peter is the father of the animal rights movement, wrote a book in 1975 called Animal Liberation. And yet, Peter argues, to show you what utilitarianism is like, Peter argues that mothers should get 28 days with newborn children to determine whether or not to keep them or to euthanize them. He has argued that children have less value than piglets than piglets, that is infants, I should say. And that's because it takes a human being years to become a productive member of society if they ever do. This is the way Peter thinks. Whereas a piglet, immediately, I mean, it can be useful. You can do things with it. This is the way utilitarians think. Peter has also argued that we need to off those individuals who are a drain on resources. So the disabled, the sick, the elderly, this kind of thing. And years ago, um, you know, she's, she's dead now, but uh, people said, well, you're inconsistent with this. You know, your mother has Alzheimer's. He goes, no, 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 I would, I would euthanize her, but my sister won't let me. So, I mean, this goes to show you how these people think. This is Bill Gates. Now, Bill Gates is more cautious in what he says, but I promise you that Bill Gates is a utilitarian. And part of this is also that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, as Lord Acton observed, and it's now something we hear an awful lot. But I really think some of these people, if you watch them, it's, it's like watching Hollywood stars who begin to lose their minds. You move into a world a realm where you have so much money that you can arrange your life in such a way that you're insulated from real life. And nothing is ever the way you don't want it. So you're like Jason Alexander and um, Bette Midler and William Shatner who went nuts when Elon Musk said, from now on to have the blue check, you got to pay eight bucks if you have an Android, or $11 a month if you have, um, what is it, iOS, uh, an Apple product. Our time's so hard. I mean, I know Star Trek has been off the air for quite a while, but does William Shatner not have ten, eight bucks, 11 bucks? Can he not afford that? Bette Midler, I mean, went nuts. Jason Alexander, go in, he's the guy from Seinfeld, the, the short, balding you know, fat guy on, uh, on that show. But when your life is such and you have so much money that everything is exactly the way you want it, 
for Twitter to tell you you'll now have to pay eight to eleven dollars a month for your blue check, that feels like a great trial in your life because you just don't know what real life is like. This is Bill Gates. This is who these people are. Now, now let's watch him here where he's even more unfiltered. And it's in an interview with the Aspen Institute. So we're, we're kind of video heavy uh, on today's show. But listen to this. Now, again, the first video is carefully scripted. It's edited. He's able to go back and watch it and say, yeah, yeah, no, I don't want to say that. No, let's cut that out. Let's put this in. And you end up with a product that is exactly what he wants. But this time, he's being interviewed. Let's hear what he says here. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. So you, of course, well, we're that's making- an interesting thing you just said, which is just the, the last three panel. months in life for one person or something, because we haven't had a discussion of how to allocate that money, it means we lay off three teachers to do so. I mean, in other words, we That's haven't right. had Society's this type of making, allocation. We're discussion. making that trade-off because of huge medical costs that are not examined to see which ones actually have no benefit whatsoever. Well, wait, and because of pension generosity, we will be laying off over 100,000 teachers, which you know I'm very much against that. Uh, and the whole AFT will agree with me on that. <laughs> Death panels. His contempt for humanity is much more evident in this interview. You're, you're, you're seeing how the ideas, how his mind actually works on this. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the way he refers to the death panels, uh, you're not supposed to talk about the death panels, meaning he thinks that's a conversation we actually need to have. And so that you'll understand what he means by death panels, he's talking about uh, essentially a committee that makes determinations about end of life care, whether or not you actually get it. This is purely utilitarian. It's the idea of determining, do we spend the resources on you to, to give you another couple of months of life or do we let you die? Now this is straight up Nazi stuff. Think I'm exaggerating throwing around the word Nazi. I mean, almost everybody does these days and you see it in the media in absurd ways. But no, here, I mean, it's literally Nazi stuff. Look up something called Action T4. Action T4. It was a Nazi program for the extermination. It was a euthanasia program for the extermination of the sick, the mentally disabled, the elderly, and the otherwise infirm. I've been to the death camps. I've been to a bunch of them. Years ago, I was awarded a fellowship to research the intellectual origins of the Holocaust. So I spent a fair amount of time in Europe taking a look at that. And I will tell you, Action T4 comes up a lot. This was their way of ridding hospitals. And they said, a drain on resources we need to get rid of these people. This is the Martin Niemöller quotation, you know, the former U-boat captain who became a Lutheran pastor and who spoke out against the Nazis. He's the guy who said, and I forget the exact order, but when they first came for the communists, I said nothing because I wasn't a communist. And when they came for, and then he says for the sick and the infirm, when they came for them, I said nothing because I was neither sick nor infirm. I said nothing. And then when they came for me, it was too late. This is straight up Nazi stuff. It also finds its modern expression in books like Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape. Sam Harris, Sam Harris comes off to me as likewise sociopathic. He has a, he has a podcast. He's one of the so-called four horsemen of the counter apocalypse along with Hitchens and Dennett and, and uh, um, Dawkins. But you say to yourself, but what about those poor teachers? I mean, <laughs> I mean, Gates is telling us, Gates is telling us that if we don't do this, then 100,000 teachers are going to lose their jobs. 
100,000 teachers are going to lose their jobs. Gates has presented us here with what in rhetoric is called the false dilemma fallacy. Here, it takes the form of an unhappy forced choice. Either we educate our children and thereby save their futures, or we save old people who are going to die soon anyway. Gates says, I'm sorry, but those are your choices. It's either the kids or we say, hey, you guys have lived a good life. We'll see you. It's time for you guys to move on. It's clear that Gates's choice is let the old people die. I mean, that comes through in that interview. It comes through quite clearly. That's what he's in favor of. He is utilitarian to his core because that's how these people think. But he's hiding it in a moral cloak. It's for the children. How many, how many awful things have been foisted upon humanity, the American people no less, by saying, it's for the children. It's for the children. We do it for the children. This is the stuff of a moral monster and a hypocrite. Let me show you just how hypocritical Bill Gates is. Now, okay, I'm a social scientist. I'm not a mathematician, so you can go back and check my math on this. But I crunched some numbers. I just, last night, I just sitting here and I look up his, uh, his net worth, which is estimated to be $125 billion dollars. That's roughly, it, it ebbs and flows. It goes up and down according to the market. But roughly, his net worth is $125 billion. Now, there are approximately 2.5 million public school teachers in America. Gates could fully fund 2 million of them at an average salary of $60,000. The average teacher salary in the United States is about $57,000. But I decided we'll be generous. We'll give them a little extra. Bill Gates could fully fund 2 million of them at a salary of $60,000 per year for a full year. <laughs> him alone, he could do that. That would leave him a cool $5 billion to suffer through on. <laughs> He'd only have $5 billion left. Times would be rough. But that's how much he would, left, would be left with. But on a more practical level, he could fund the 100,000 teachers who he says are being laid off due to health care costs for the elderly. He could fund that 100,000 people indefinitely. Indefinitely. Because that's a $6 billion a year cost to him. He probably sneezes that much in office supplies for as many businesses, <laughs> his travel expenses, maintaining as many homes, his, his uh, fleet of airplanes and cars and personal staff. Six billion dollars to Bill Gates isn't even what a Christian thinks of as a proper 10% tithe. It isn't even close. And as an aside, it's worth saying this. As the head of a nonprofit, trust me, I have a lot of experience in this. Generosity isn't about how much money you've got, nor even how much you give away. It isn't about that. Some of the most generous people I have ever known didn't have much money. Years ago, when I was an undergraduate, uh, taking a course in statistics, and we all had to do a project, and I decided to do it on church giving. And uh, what I discovered was that, the, you know what, what demographic was the most generous with their money? Middle and lower income people. They gave away, they gave away north of 10% of their own income. North of 10% of their own income. The mo what I discovered in that statistical analysis is the more money you made, the less people gave away. The number might be higher. In other words, you know, again, Bill Gates could give away a billion dollars, but that isn't even 1% of his net worth. The more they made, the less they gave away. And it was interesting to notice how much people with less, particularly Christians, Christians give away 10 times more of their income than do atheists, evangelicals do. 10 times more, according to McLean's Magazine, Canadian publication. And that is because they're more likely to see what they own as belonging to God. And that it's just theirs 
to use for that purpose. So Bill Gates, you might be wowed and impressed when you say, oh, wow, he gave away a billion dollars. For Bill Gates, it's not a huge sum. But we're going to take a little closer look at what he's doing with this. But this argument that he makes here in this video, in this interview at the Aspen Institute, it's an emotional argument. And it's an emotional argument meant to manipulate the audience. Come on, people, we have to make this hard choice. I know you love grandma, but you need to say goodbye to her and let her die. Because we got to save the kids. But it goes deeper than that. Let's watch this interview that he did, I think with BBC, though it could be with Sky News. Both of them have their logo on this. But this is, this is very interesting to me and very telling. Let's listen to this. What do you say to the charge that if you are a climate change campaigner, but you also travel around the world on a private jet, you're a hypocrite? Well, I, I by the gold standard of funding Climeworks, to do direct air capture that far exceeds my family's carbon footprint. And I spend billions of dollars on, on climate innovation. So, you know, should I stay at home and not come to Kenya and learn about farming and malaria? Anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with the idea that not only am I not part of the problem by paying for the offsets, but uh, also through the billions that my Breakthrough Energy Group is spending, that I'm part of the solution. I'm not part of the problem. I'm part of the solution. I'm a billionaire. Told you it was better than us. <laughs> That's what they think. So here Bill Gates is saying, and let me quote, I'm comfortable with the idea that I'm not part of the problem a part of the solution. He has judged himself and found himself worthy. <laughs> Case closed. You can't question Bill Gates. You're not allowed to. I'm my own judge. And guess what? I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. Now, I want to be clear on this point. I'm comfortable with people flying private. I have friends who can and do. Good for you. Good for you. I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is that Bill Gates is saying, you can't fly private. You can't drive your car. You can't do this. You can't do that because you leave a big carbon footprint. Meanwhile, he's leaving a massive carbon footprint going all over the globe in his private jet. But he says, these rules don't apply to me. None of these rules apply to me. And this also is the way the World Economic Forum, of which he is a member, this is the way all these people think. Remember, I was in Davos. I was there at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> it took me a day to get there by several trains. These guys flew in on private jets, and then they helicopter. They couldn't be bothered to take, <laughs> to take automobiles. Even the big, huge you know, Mercedes and BMWs that they were driving, nope, couldn't do that. They helicoptered from the airport into Davos. And then they were picked up in their fleets of cars. And boy, I took pictures of all the fleets of automobiles these people showed up in. They want you driving a smart car that's about the size of this desk. Not them. The rules don't apply to them. And Bill Gates is clearly comfortable with the ideas of death panels because he doesn't see death panels as applying to him. How old is Gates? I think he's 67. I think he's 67. One of the guys on, on set here, please look that up for me. Shouldn't he off himself and make room for others to save the planet? If he were okay, So we've confirmed it. He's 67. If he's consistent with his thinking here, he should off himself to make room for other people on the planet. But no, he doesn't do that. And he doesn't do that because he doesn't think the rules apply to him. And I also want to point out here how full he is of his own self-importance. Do you get that? Does that come through? Can you see that? Gates sees himself as extremely important. Now, if you are a subscriber to this channel, and I hope you are, please subscribe. We need to have something that runs right along the bottom that says, please subscribe and share. I hope you will. Then you have heard me warn consistently of two things. The first is ideologues. Ideologues. These are individuals who see ideas, their own ideas, is more important than people. 
They think ideas matter more than people. The great genocides of history, almost all of them, those in the 20th century were carried out by ideologues. They're individuals who thought their idea of building a utopian state, be it a fascist one or a socialist one, a Marxist one, they're both expressions of the left. That will get a lot of comments from, from, from some of you because you, you don't like me saying that. But fascism is an ideology of the left. But I'll explain that in a future podcast. All of them were driven by these kinds of people. Their ideas mattered more than, peop uh, more than people. And this is the way Bill Gates thinks. This is the way utilitarians think. And then the second thing I've warned you about is this. This is atheism taken to its logical, practical conclusions. Now, I've had a number of you say in the comments, hey, I'm an atheist and I like your podcast. I'm not one of those people. That doesn't apply to me. I appreciate that. I appreciate the many non-Christians who follow this podcast. And I'm especially grateful if you're not a megalomaniac. But if you are an atheist and you follow your atheism to its logical, practical conclusion, you must come to a place that says that human life is no more valuable than any other human life. This is why Peter Singer, who is an atheist, says, and it's perfectly consistent with his worldview, that a, that a, a human baby has no more value than a piglet. He says the idea that human beings have more value than other, other animals on the planet is a holdover from Christian thinking, from Judeo-Christian thinking. It's his idea that human beings are made in the image of God and are objects of special creation. That's what I believe. That's what every Christian should believe. But if you don't believe that, says Singer, then you have to conclude that they have no more value than any other animal on the planet. And he has concluded that consistently with his worldview. This is Bill Gates. He's not debating the existence of God. He just, he just assumes there isn't one. He's just driving his thinking. So I've warned you of these. Gates' thinking reminds me of Edward Gibbon's pre-Darwinian thesis in The Rise and Decline of the Roman Empire. Very, very famous very, very famous history. But Gibbon says that the Roman Empire fell. Do you know why? Because of the Christian faith. He says a Christian faith sapped it, sapped the Romans of their fighting virtues. Now, I would agree with that if they had the equivalent of, say, Russell Moore preaching in that period. If Russell Moore had pulpits in that time, there's no question that those churches would be producing some very candy-ass Christians. <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're getting some laughter off, off the set here, but it's true. It's true. This is the kind of, kind of milquetoast Christianity that is present in modern day. It's not hard for me to imagine that some of that crap was going on in Edward, excuse me, well, in Edward Gibbons' time too, but particularly in the, uh, the 5th century BC, the Roman Empire is said to have, Rome is said to have collapsed in 476 AD. So there might have been a Beth Moore or Russell Moore running around at that time <laughs> who, brought, who brought down one of the great empires. I think it's possibly true. But the argument was that Christianity ran contrary to nature because you see, Bill Gates' thinking is Darwinian. It's social Darwinism, actually. You're keeping alive by feeding people, by giving them medicines. If it leads to overpopulation, you shouldn't be doing that, thinks Bill Gates. Because you're keeping alive people that, that natural selection, nature itself, would cull from the population. You know, an interesting little book, this is Nietzsche, by the way. It's Friedrich Nietzsche. It's interesting that Friedrich Nietzsche's you know, primary works came after the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859. Friedrich Nietzsche's major works follow that. He was deeply influenced by Darwin, you can follow a straight line from Darwin, Nietzsche, to Hitler. Nazi thinking, the T4 program, was Darwinian straight through. 
So is Bill Gates thinking, whether or not he knows it. And I doubt he does because he is a technocrat, as almost all these guys are, meaning they don't seem to have any, any real background or rooting, not just in, not just in a, a religious faith, but they don't seem to even have it in a, a moral education that literature can provide. Parents, especially those of you who are homeschooling, if you want to fortify the hearts and minds of your children against the nonsense we're seeing in the street, in addition to teaching them, not a shallow, but a, a robust Christian faith, get them into good Western literature. Get them into Shakespeare. Get them reading Shakespeare. Get them reading the, the Western canon of great writers. It will stimulate their minds. It will stimulate their hearts. Get them reading Tolstoy. Get them reading Faulkner. Not because all these individuals, their lives, you know, reflected a, a Christian faith, but they were reacting to it. They were reacting to it uh, in some instances, and it will be helpful to them. An interesting little book that Bill Gates would love is George Bernard Shaw's Major Barbara. Major Barbara was a play, I think, uh, hit the stage like 1904, 1905. And Major Barbara is the story of a, a Barbara who is a major in the Salvation Army, and she is the Ill, Ill, illegitimate um, child of a multimillionaire who owns a cannon factory, and he is an atheist. And it is the two of them trying to convert each other. She's trying to convert him to the Christian faith. She, he's trying to convert her to utilitarianism. And of course, because Bernard Shaw was himself an atheist, it is the father who wins the debate and pulls her over to his side. This is the kind of thinking that's going on here. And this is what I mean when I say that Christianity is the great enemy of leftists and globalists. It is the antidote to this kind of thinking. Now, at this point, one might reasonably ask the question, who does Bill Gates think that he is? Who does this guy think that he is? that he can set the agenda for things. Why is it that he is suddenly too? I mean, did you notice throughout the pandemic, the guy was everywhere? He still is. But I was in other countries and I'd be passing, I would be passing a, a TV in a hotel or in an airport and there would be Bill Gates giving an interview on CNN or on BBC or on Al Jazeera, Sky News. Why is Bill Gates suddenly the go-to guy on vaccines, population control, farming, et cetera? I mean, the, guy, the guy's a computer programmer. That's what he is. He's not an expert in any of these things. He's a technocrat, just like Klaus Schwab, as I pointed out in the podcast on Klaus Schwab. Well, there's no reason for him to be deemed an expert on any of these things, any more than... than you or me or anyone who's sitting in the studio today, there's no reason beyond the fact that he is rich and he has used his wealth to buy himself a seat at the policymaking table and to elevate himself to the status of a cultural sage and a public intellectual. He's literally bought this place in society. As of 2021, he had given no less than $300 million directly to media outlets, ranging from CNN and NPR to BBC and Al Jazeera, to promote his global agenda. He's given it through his foundation, so he's getting the tax deduction. He gives money to the foundation, and then the foundation gives money where he directs it. And you may say, well, you can't control that, but he can, because written into the rules of these donations to these media outlets is how it can be used, what kind of stories, what kind of reporters it can be spent on. And it has to be spent in the manner in which he directs it. So he's been able to do this. Do a search. Pause the podcast right now. I don't care what your search engine is. Bing, especially Bing. Doesn't he own Bing? Bing is Microsoft. I'm pretty sure he owns Bing. Yep, he does. Um, Google, DuckDuckGo, whatever else is out there. Do a search on Bill Gates and depopulation and see what you get. 
I did it last night. The first several pages were almost entirely fact checks that were designed to defend Bill Gates. They were all about defending Bill Gates. Listen to this one from USA Today, this headline. Fact check, claim, missing context on Bill Gates' 2010 quote about population sustainability. There's the word I've been warning you about, sustainability. Beware of the use of sustainability. Nothing good comes on the backside of that. And then it goes on to say this. Social media users are claiming that billionaire tech titan Bill Gates is part of a conspiracy to depopulate the earth. Again, I reject the use of the word conspiracy because conspiracies are, by definition, as I pointed out on the front end of this podcast, they are secret. Bill Gates' depopulation agenda is not secret. He's speaking openly about it. But again, he's speaking about it in terms of sustainability. He's speaking about it in a way that cloaks it in a moral cause. He's careful about the way he says it. He doesn't say it nearly so openly as, let's say, um, Thomas Malthus did, where we get the idea of, you know, on population, I think was the name of his book that he wrote in like 1790s. This is Malthusian as well, Malthusian thinking. Now, why does Bill Gates get such favorable media attention? Well, here's what Jacobin Magazine, and by the way, Jacobin Magazine is a socialist magazine, meaning it is hard left. It is hard left. This is what Jacobin Magazine's Luke Savage had to say in a conversation with freelance journalist Tim Schwab, not related to Klaus. Tim Schwab, who tried to follow the money at the Gates Foundation. Now, I appreciate this conversation because though it is hard leftist, uh, this magazine, and undoubtedly both of these writers, there's integrity in this. Meaning they were really endeavoring to tell the truth of what was going on with the money at the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation has a $50 billion endowment and virtually no board beyond Bill and Melinda Gates to determine where that money goes. There's been a lot of questions about their board and about where this money is actually going. So this is a conversation, again, between Luke Savage of Jacobin Magazine and freelance writer Tim Schwab. Savage says, something that I think is generally well understood on the left is that the kind of charitable giving practiced by someone like Gates is neither an actual solution to global problems nor even an act of individual generosity, but rather a kind of brand building you undertake if you ascend to his level of wealth and influence. Schwab, yeah, absolutely. Something like NPR is probably a good example since it has a generally liberal point of view, which already chimes with the Gates Foundation's worldview anyway. But now they've taken, I think, 22 million from the Gates Foundation, which is really a lot of money for a newsroom. The foundation is funding journalism conferences and journalism fellowships, as well as news organizations. And the analysis I did was very conservative and probably a very serious underestimation because you can't actually track all of the money the Gates Foundation has been giving away. There's this black hole of funding that it gives through contracts. It doesn't disclose where that money is going. So it's definitely more than a quarter of a billion dollars. And since I did my analysis, of course, Gates has given even more. They recently gave $3.6 million to CNN, which to me kind of explains why CNN has been so cozy with Gates during the pandemic. Now, let's go back to the fact check from USA Today. I dug a little deeper. Guess who owns USA Today? Gannett, Gannett News Service owns them. Bill Gates has given them a lot of money. So when you see these fact checks defending, I mean, when you do something wrong in society or when you're accused of doing something wrong, does USA Today, does Reuters, does NBC, does ABC, does the New York Times, do they all Snopes? Do they all jump to your defense with fact checks? Of course not. We noted in a podcast on WEF chairman, World Economic Forum chairman, founder and 
soul chairman, Klaus Schwab, how the media serves as a kind of guardian for him and his agenda. Same thing is going on here, and now you know why it's going on. Gates is deeply involved with the World Economic Forum, which is, like him, deeply committed to the depopulation agenda. See our podcast on the WEF. We pointed out to you factually their own founding documents, the documents which have influenced them. We demonstrate to you that this is what they are about. And the steady drip of anti-human, save-the-planet rhetoric from Gates and World Economic Forum types and the United Nations and the World Health Organization and others leads to commercials like this. This is astonishing commercial. Let's watch this. This is a commercial that is put out by Simmons. Simmons is a, um, it is a Canadian fashion brand. Imagine a fashion brand putting this out. Let's, let's listen to this. Last breaths are sacred. When I imagine my final days, I see bubbles. I see the ocean. I see music. Even now, as I seek help to end my life, there is still so much beauty. You just have to be brave enough to see it. Did you see that? Here is a commercial that has absolutely nothing to do with selling clothing. This is driven by ESG. Simmons is seeking to get a favorable ESG rating because, hey, we put out, we put out a commercial that was for the common good about a woman who chose to end her life due to pain. She suffered from physical pain. Now, first of all, I have no sympathy for her in that regard. I suffer from a lot of physical pain. You're a coward if you choose to end your life because of that. And that's what she chose to do. But what they've done is they have, they have made it seem so beautiful. Here she is. She says, when I think about my last breaths, I think about bubbles. I think about beauty. And at the end, they bring up on the screen her name, and they say, you know, they, they give the dates of her life because she did end her life. She did end her life. And instead of this being presented as a, oh, wow, we have people out there committing suicide, they're choosing to kill themselves. What you have here is someone choosing suicide. Now, she didn't put a gun in her mouth or she didn't slit her wrists in a warm bathtub. They call this in Canada, MAIDS, Medical Assistance in Dying. It sounds so harmless, doesn't it? MAIDS, yeah, it's like the nice lady who comes around and cleans up. It's the lady who comes around and cleans up with a scythe. <laughs> She's coming for you, for your life. That's what this is. Maids, so wonderful. All of the thinking, the utilitarian thinking, the utilitarian messaging, which by the way, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested a ton of money in core curriculum. Common core to educate your children in public schools. It's pushing a lot of this agenda, also pushing the sexual confusion. They've in, in, invested heavily in that. And the steady drip of that kind of thinking leads to a fashion brand publishing a pro-death video. It's as if these people saw the 1975 sci-fi film Logan's Run <laughs> and thought it was a societal blueprint. <laughs> hey, that looks great. Let's make a society like that. Be careful, Bill Gates. In Logan's Run, which I watched for the first time since childhood, I watched it just this past week because I wanted to remind myself of the thesis in that. D don't bother. Uh, as sci-fi goes, it's, it's terrible sci-fi in terms of the, uh, you know, the eff effects. But in Logan's run, if you're 30 years old, you die at 30. Bill Gates, you're 67. You've outlived your usefulness. Now, many of you have asked, what can I do? And as I have said in other episodes of this podcast, 
my intention here is just simply to give you an avalanche of depressing information and say, <laughs> see ya at, at the end. Rather, my goal is to inform you, it is to encourage you, and it is to mobilize you. That is my goal in this. Because I think what we're seeing in this country, again, as I say, is the tail wagging the dog. The more majority of people don't watch a Simmons commercial like that or listen to the things we've heard Bill Gates say in this and agree with that. But a lot of people, a lot of you, are just kind of quietly going along. I got into a bit of an argument with a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, who is a, um, he's a, He's a writer, he's a thinker, and he said, you know what, I'm just gonna retire, I'm sick of all this stuff. I'm not gonna live to see what all this stuff is like. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The Bible knows nothing of retired Christians. Caleb in the Bible at 80 said, give me that mountain, that he might subdue it. We don't have time for people to sit on the porch. We need you to engage, particularly those of you who know better, who understand what's going on. Let your dying breath, let your epitaph be, I did all that I could do. So no, no room for that. Three things that I would tell you to do here. And there's a fourth that I will add just by way of methodology. First is pray. Now that may sound trite to you. Yeah, okay, whatever. I don't mean it like that. I think the God of the Bible is ready to act on our behalf, but he wants to be asked. You know, the parable of the persistent widow, she just keeps going and going and going. And finally, the, the judge gives her justice. God is like that. God wants us to ask him to act on our behalf. And I believe we, he will if we humble ourselves and do it. Second, engage the people around you in your own lives. You may not have the platform that I have here, but you will meet people that I will never meet. There are people in your circle that you can engage and you can do so hopefully with the confidence that I want to give you on a podcast like this. Engage with them. Speak up. And every bit as importantly is hold your elected officials accountable. Right now, they do not feel accountable to you. You need to be that persistent widow. You need to be that persistent widower. You need to be that persistent person who drives your congressman, your mayor, your school boards. You need to drive those people crazy by saying, I won't tolerate this. I won't tolerate this. Make your voices heard. Don't just apathetically go along. And then finally, I just say this to you by way of methodology. How do you find encouragement? Well, I hope this podcast gives you a little encouragement. But I would add this. I have learned as a student of history that the saints of history are there to equip us. Let them equip you. There's nothing new under the sun, scripture tells us. We've been here before. We've won. These ideas just morph as they go along and they just take on new packaging. But there's nothing new about it. There are great men and women in history who fought against these evils and they won. Look to them, seek them out, seek out their writings, learn from their experiences. Let them tell you from the past what they learned. And as we close, I just want to thank you for your interest in this new podcast. I think as I'm speaking, we've had roughly 2 million YouTube downloads alone, just in the month or so since we've started. That's pretty incredible. That's humbling. We're excited about that. We're excited by the response. We're excited by the opportunity to engage with you. I've been trying to come up with a clever name for um, the followers of this of this podcast. I haven't been able to come up with anything yet, but I solicit your feedback. You know, Rush Limbaugh called his ditto heads affectionately. His his followers of, of that show, they were called ditto heads. I don't know what to call you guys, but I do want to give you a collective name for fans of this podcast. Thank you so very much for your interest. And I end with this. Many of you have mentioned in the comments you want book recommendations. Pay attention to the books 
that I put here on this desk. They're ones that I'm currently reading or using or consulting in doing this podcast. Some of you are paying very close attention to the books on the table. So I didn't start out with that intention, but now I will. I'll refresh the table from time to time. Thanks for tuning in.